Welcome to the podcast, Working. I'm your host, Dan Doriani. The goal of this podcast is to fire the imagination of Christians who long to practice their faith at work. We do this primarily by interviewing people who have a story to tell about the way they practice their convictions as they work. Our guests may be famous or unknown, highly successful or quietly faithful. We meet doctors, athletes, broadcasters, librarians, presidents, intellectuals, politicians, journalists, leaders of startups, and more. Today's guest is Bruce Hoey, a pioneering surgeon and medical researcher and my friend. Bruce and I have had many rich conversations about faith and work. So Bruce, welcome to this uh, this podcast on working, and I am so glad to have you here. You've had a uh, you've had a very interesting career. You started off as a student of surgery many years ago, and then uh, and then as time went by, or maybe pretty quickly, you decided that you wanted to get involved in a very specific kind of surgery, um, and that's in the field of the head and neck, and that's that's not necessarily the easiest place to operate. Can you uh, can just tell us, give a little background about what someone like you does, and then we'll get into the specifics of your task. What does it mean to operate on the head and neck? Sure. Well, thanks for, again for the welcome, Dan. Um, operating on the head and neck is, uh, to me, uh, uh, first of all, fascinating. And, and the reason is that uh, it's probably the area of the human body where vital structures are packed in as tightly as they come. Um, and so disease processes that arise in, in that part of the human anatomy are complicated to remove or take care of. Um, and because removals involve disruption of normal anatomy and physiology, which is so important in everything a human being does in terms of this part, upper part of the body being uh, critical for communication, for breathing, for swallowing, for social intercourse. Hearing. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. we're looking at each other in the area of the body where I work. And yeah. so it, it carries with it tremendous challenges uh, for preserving the functions that we all rely on so critically day to day, moment by moment. Um, so how I got involved in this was, uh, as you said, early on in medical school in New Zealand, um, I was really struggling with um, making some choices uh, as to which pathway to follow. I knew I loved surgery because of the technical aspects of it. Uh, and my innate impatience gave me quick results from what I was doing in surgical endeavors. Uh, and then in particular, um, the anatomy of the area fascinated me when I saw it laid out for surgery. So that's what got me going in that area. Yeah, so I'm just gonna pause. And uh, although it's not a major point, uh, I, I think you said something important. You're, you recognized your innate impatience. And some aspects of medicine involve treating people for months and months, possibly even years. And you had sufficient self-awareness to see yourself as somebody who likes to get a task done. Is that accurate? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, one of the things we work on in this uh, podcast is uh, finding your calling, understanding your calling. So, of course, we aren't always right. I mean, we might be impatient and have to overcome our impatience. And I'm sure you learned, I know you learned, and that'll lead us to the next, uh, next topic, that um, you may care for somebody for a long time after the surgery. And it's not going to be as quick as perhaps you would have wished at your first blush when you're a 23-year-old. Absolutely. And uh, building on that, um as I moved into surgery and then head and neck surgery in particular, uh, I became aware that I had to exercise a lot of patients uh, in these long and complicated procedures. Yes. One is uh, focused down on very specific tasks for a long period of time and hours in any one day, mm -hmm. in any one case, uh, yeah. sometimes teens of hours, not too often that level now, like the technologies have rapidly increased the speed at which we do these procedures. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the, the, the patients had to come in as well, for sure. Yeah. Uh, 
the, the results were next day, should we say, but then as you say, looking after folks uh, who had suffered uh, from diseases that were, the outcome was not necessarily finally decided by the surgery right. uh, and required careful follow-up did indeed involve a lot of, uh, I would say it turned out to be very rewarding interactions with a lot of people over a lot of, lot of years and decades, yeah. yeah. There's so much to talk about, but one of the things that fascinate uh, people who hear about surgery is the, you know, the idea that surgeons sometimes do operate on one person for 20 minutes, a simple, you know, maybe a, a scope of a knee or taking some screws out of somebody's hand after a, after a fix, after a broken bone, but uh, it can also be five hours or eight hours in once in a while, 12, 13, 14 hours. Now, I know that you have always been a person who has been very interested in physical fitness and, you know, you've worked out and and pursued sports your whole life. Is that, uh, is, is, is a surgery that lasts, let's just say 10 or 11 hours. Is that more a matter of mental stamina? Uh, is it physical stamina? Is it both? How do you, how does somebody actually do that? How do you operate for 10, 11, 12 hours? Um, surprisingly, once you get in the mode and are trained to do it correctly, Mm -hmm. um, without too much difficulty, Dan. But I would say it's the mental focus that, that drives you along. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say you'd be suffering terribly at the end of that and the next day or two uh, because of the ergonomics or, or the violation of ergonomic principles right. that, can, that can set in after 10 or 12 hours of surgery. Um, and so I would say the physical fitness is unquestionably very helpful, but not essential. Mm -hmm. I see some fairly unphysical folks doing the same work quite well uh, as, as uh, those of us who try to stay in shape. Okay. So uh, I know, I think I know what you mean, the ergonomics, meaning you're bending maybe at an angle hour after hour and you're twisting your torso in the same direction. Correct. And, and one can do anything. I, you know, I just, uh, I was just listening to a, a presentation by a mount, a rock climber and she was climbing El Capitan for 20, 21 hours. And she said, it's mostly, it's, it is mostly mental, uh, but by golly, you do have to be fit to pull it off uh, without, without agony. So, um, uh, so let me go to uh, the care afterward. One of the things you got involved in pretty quickly was uh, the removal of cancerous growths uh, in the sinus, behind the eyes, behind the nose, and uh, in the throat area. And um, as you have told me, the treatment alone can sometimes result in death. Now, if, if there's no treatment, there will also be death. So you, you, the treatment is mandatory. Uh, anytime you walk into surgery, we know there's a tiny risk of death. Um, and so you're saving people's lives, but also risking their lives. And beyond that, there was the question when you, you, know, when you operate somebody's face, you, you get involved in parts of the body that um, you don't want to disrupt. Tell us about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, so, so again, going back to the tight packing of, of anatomical structures that are critical to breathing, eating, swallowing, um, communicating. Uh, when we remove uh, growths that are impinging on one or two or three of those functions, those functions are disrupted by the removal. Um, and if a patient was left in the resected state where the tumor or the mass was taken out, uh, those functions were impacted and nothing further was done, it, yes, it could be a slow but steady deterioration towards death. Um, so one of my early interests was how do we do the surgery that puts those functions back in place better than we had been doing. I trained at a wonderful place. I traveled from New Zealand to the University of Iowa in Iowa City, which was the leading center. I was very fortunate to get a training position there from New Zealand um, way back in the 80s when I trained. But one of the things they were leading the charge in worldwide was the reconstructive aspects. And so my, my abiding interest has been in the uh, um, ways, techniques, tissue transfers and so forth uh, that we can accomplish to restore function. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, that in itself is enormously challenging because we're taking beautifully designed structures like the human tongue 
mm -hmm. of which there's no other tissue like it in the body or the human larynx, where again, we're a complex of beautiful uh, nerves, muscles, skeletal structures and so forth are uh, uh, molded into this wonderful thing through which, you know, you can see hear an opera singer uh, right down to a whisper in your wife's ear, uh, you know, is, is something that uh, can be missing in folks uh, if we do these big procedures. So yeah, the reconstructive aspect was what caught my attention very early as the big need that we needed to continue uh, developing in the medical science. Yeah, so just, just for our people, for the common folk, we just have to remember that if uh, you interfere with somebody's salivary glands enough, they don't have saliva. And to live without saliva is a very difficult thing. And you're going to have to be sipping water nonstop, and it's never going to work as well as the God-designed salivary glands. And if you nick a nerve that affects the tongue, uh, I think it's fair to say there's nothing like the human tongue in the universe. I mean, this is one of God's supreme creations. Correct. And, and it gets a mention in the Bible, as you know, as, yeah, as, a, right. as a danger organ. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, all powerful things are dangerous things, right? <laughs> yeah, James. They, they can do great good and they can do great evil. That's right. like the rudder of a ship. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, you're not, uh, I'll, I'll boast for you, uh, or maybe boast in what the Lord has done through you, but, you know, pretty soon you became, not, I don't mean six weeks, but you know, before too long, you did make some progress. And for a while, you were, you know, one of the world's experts. And you sometimes were flown thousands of miles to operate on uh, people whose lives needed to be saved and preserved. And people flew to you from all over the world. That's exciting. You want to tell us about that a little bit? And then I'll, then I'll move over to uh, the need to transfer your knowledge to others, which I think is, is more, you know, it's, it's great to be the guy who can do something. It's even greater to train 50 other people who can do that. But just tell us about uh, what it was like in that uh, rapid growth of knowledge phase. Yeah. So um, the, yeah, the demands of the procedures can certainly be compounded uh, when one is uh, transported to a foreign environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, by no means am I the only person in my field, let alone in other fields, who get asked to go do surgery on people who have a specific need in a specific place in the world. But having said that, it's, uh, it is very interesting. Um, it is a, there are potential for an enormous number of distractions as one is, uh, you know, traveling and then getting settled into where one is doing the work. Usually it was by invitation of practitioners who do some of what I do, but who knew that their patient needed, you know, a specific technique. So Asia, Europe, uh, down under were, were continents where we did surgery. I did surgery. Usually, I, I usually went on my own. Uh, I was blessed if Helen was able to travel with me. Um, but then the it would be a matter of settling in with the team there, getting to know the operating room team a day or two beforehand and then doing the surgery. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, challenging uh, because sometimes I remember I was operating in Munich once <laughs> and they, uh, we, we were putting together little tiny vessels to revascularize a flap that we brought from another part of the body. And these little vessels don't like being handled very much and they go into spasm, they tighten down and we have a nice little smooth thing that goes inside the vessel and dilates it and uh they didn't have one. <laughs> oh no and you just assumed they did i did i did i had checked uh -huh. the sets but i had overlooked the fact that they didn't have one of those so mm -hmm. i actually improvised i used something else that was smooth and slightly less customed custom yes. designed for that procedure so i now when i when i do a, that technique i always refer to it by to my residents and fellows as the, the hoey dilator <laughs> well, it, uh, so you've done surgery all over the world, and I've spoken in many places. And what I've found um, is that when you're constantly watching yourself and constantly saying your customs may be different here, perhaps you're misunderstanding each other. As long as you keep, bear that in mind all the time, you're probably going to be okay. It's when you start assuming that you know another culture or their ways that you're prone to misstep. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and when I, you know, I've done some um, charity slash 
mission work too, as you know, Dan. And that, that's where I learned after the first not so good interventions in uh, Ukraine, when, just when the Soviet Union was disbanding, right. uh, I found some interventions there that there was no doubt that I had to take all my instruments with me if I was going to do further trips. Right, right. So um, uh, you've got a teacher's bone in your body, we might say. You have a, a desire to teach. Uh, you were, um, when I was seeing you most often, you were always talking about your residents, the people you were training, where they came from. I met a number of them. Um, how do you move from knowing how to do something that relatively few people know how to do, some pioneering work? Um, what's it like to train? I don't know how many people you've trained, certainly dozens. Uh, what is it like? What are the pros, the cons? And in some ways, it slows you down, but in other ways, it multiplies your labors, right? It does, uh, both, uh, true. Um, but there's something so rewarding about seeing someone, uh, first of all, show enthusiasm mm -hmm. for what we love to do, what I love to do, um, and then to apply themselves to learning the, the techniques or the approaches. So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, numbers aren't everything, but 25 fellows later, and fellows are specializing in what I do, or what one of my colleagues does, and then 135 residents later, uh, one has had a, a rich uh, life's experience of interaction with trainees. Mm -hmm. And I, I just uh, love it when I have the opportunity to uh, either explain something spontaneously or for them to ask me questions. And yeah. it's actually, you know, we do a lot of ranking and, and rating of trainees now. It's become yes. very <laughs> detailed. Um, but uh, I would say the thing that it makes it much easier, even with the detail we're required to report on folks, uh, is that um, you can tell pretty much right away who's, who's a born, who has a born surgical skill and a nice set of um, questions and intellectual curiosity that will lead them forward in what they are uh, saying they want to do. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So uh, that's, that's very interesting, Bruce. And a lot of it, of course, has to do with sheer giftedness. A lot of it has to do with a desire to grow. And, yeah. and it's also going to be connected to our providential background. I mean, to yeah. find our calling, in part, we have to you know, pray that God leads us and keep our eyes open to providential calling. In your case, your father was an architect and sort of a designer by nature. Uh, you know, maybe he had a little bit of engineering or, or something like that in him. And so there were tools around your house all the time. And what people don't, people don't realize sometimes that surgeons have, you know, little saws like everybody else does, except their saws are just a lot better. Yeah. And, and it's maybe a lot smaller, um, but it's, it's mechanical work at times. There's a mechanical aspect. Oh, absolutely. Um, so the musculoskeletal structures like the jaws Mm -hmm. um, that have to be strong and functional. Um, yeah, the, 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 and understanding the engineering work that's been done on the human body and where the forces and where all the Newtons of force mm -hmm. are being exerted in those structures. Um, yeah, it's essential that uh, one has at least some background in that area. I could usually tell with a trainee whether or not they'd been anywhere near a, a workshop of some sort. Uh, and that was very helpful. I mean, you, you thank God, right? Dude, right, I Bruce, my, my, you my, were around that as a child. My dad was an architect, but he also was a very expert craftsman uh, and he could make things and he made numerous boats and models for me when I was a youngster uh, that I absolutely loved. And I was in the workshop watching him make these uh, for me. And then he introduced me to sailing. And I was thinking about this, I'd forgotten to mention that, but at the age of seven, I was given a seven foot little sailboat to go out and learn to sail. And that taught uh, resourcefulness under pressure with a vast number of different factors operating to one, keep your boat upright and two, keep your boat at the head of the fleet if you were racing your boat. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was a sporting experience early on that was very formative. Yeah, uh, I'm just- Balancing the weather, balancing the sails, balancing all the parts of the boat, balancing the opposition, uh, that was a, early rich experience. And if I'm picking up what you're putting down, Bruce, you're saying that to a certain extent, um, 
maybe it helped you improvise that that little device instead of panicking you were around around the need to improvise but also balance i mean the body balances maybe a sailboat is a mm -hmm. little bit like a human body mm -hmm. absolutely it is um very complicated if you really think about all the factors that can go into making you go fast or go slowly mm -hmm. uh, so that was a that was also looking back a very formative experience but yes the the culture in our family was my dad always had he had a separate room in the house where he would he had an architectural firm in the city and you know numbers of employees etc cetera, etc cetera. but he always had in the house a, a drawing board set up um, with the appropriate lighting and drawing materials and so forth and he was always to to his i think great credit uh, continuing to create in his mind and 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 to uh, to, to to design yeah yeah um, so let's see what what goes into making a surgeon. You have to have a certain mental acuity. You uh, you need to have uh, skills with your hands. You need to have a curiosity. Um, when you're working with the fine structures, maybe I'm, I'm not trying to uh, you know assess relative skills here, but maybe if you're working on knees or hips, those are larger structures. Um, you work on fine structures packed in, as you say, and that calls for a steady hand, does it not? And you, you can desire to be a head, you know, head neck uh, surgeon. If your hands wobble a little bit, you may want to do something else. Is that fair? That is fair. Everyone has a tremor, but some of us have a micro tremor mm -hmm. where you, you, one holds one hands up and they don't shake and don't and don't don't move like this. But others have more gross tremor. Yep. Um, so I, again, I guess early on, I noticed that in medical school that when we were dissecting fine structures um one day we were given a hen's egg that had been fertilized not like the one you eat right in medical school and we were given a little monocular microscope mm -hmm. and the lecturer said i want you folks to lift the embryo out of that egg under the microscope <laughs> and it was a little daunting yeah uh, but i well remember just um sitting down there i guess taking a few deep breaths because she was, she was a hawk. She was wandering around watching us very carefully. <laughs> she was a hawk walk, watching the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Little short lady, but very yeah. uh, powerful yeah. uh, woman. And she, uh, she made us do that. And I guess she was uh, visibly impressed when somehow by God's grace, I was able to lift that embryo out whole. And it's tiny if you've mm -hmm. seen an early fertilized hen's egg. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great exercise, but it, but it um, was encouraging, of course. But later on, I did have some struggles with surgical techniques um, that were really quite daunting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, I, one of the questions I deal with most often is, how do you know you're in right calling? How do you find it? Maybe if you're in a calling, how do you adjust a little bit? And a theme that uh, I have is that it's important to have a sense of who you are, but it's also equally important or more important to have somebody who knows you and knows the field tell you, I see a skill in you. In other words, if I want to be a, a major league baseball player, um, that may seem plausible till I'm about 11. And then I start looking at really good pitchers and, and the coach starts telling me that it might be good for me to consider another sport if I want, if I want to be a professional athlete. Uh, and so I need to listen to that and silence myself. And you had, uh, or, or quiet my dreams, you had someone who knew and who saw and said, Bruce, I think you should look into this. Is that fair? That is, that is absolutely correct. Um, my dad, much as I loved him, because uh, another sport I played as a youngster was rugby, which in New Zealand is a national religion, should we say? Right. Yeah. Everyone yeah. plays it. Uh, and my dad thought I was, as, as a teenager, was I was just a big bumbling rugby player who couldn't do fine stuff. Yeah. And he, by this time, he was hearing me starting to talk about surgery. <laughs> and he, he was a Rotarian. Uh, Auckland has a Rotary representative for the different professions. Uh, he was the Rotarian architect in Auckland. And so he, he behind my back, <laughs> he started <laughs> talking to his physician friends at Rotary whether or not his son, Bruce, could be a surgeon, could even be a doctor. Mm. And uh, surprisingly, they affirmed that 
there wasn't any reason, despite the fact that I was a, I was a front row rugby player. Uh -huh. um, and so that was, that was the first thing. But, but probably as you, in the vein of what you just said, the main encouragement came from an otolaryngologist in Auckland, um, a guy called Ron Goody. And Ron was a goodie. I mean, he was a wonderful guy who uh, saw the potential uh, that I, I showed in my early career and actually drew me away from another specialty into this mm. specialty mm. because he saw that potential. But one very uh, memorable moment uh, was that Ron and I would, he would give me simple cases to do in one operating room and he would be doing more complicated cases in another operating room immediately through the, through the doorway. So we call it a dual module training system and it's really good uh, as long as you have the right cases assigned to you. And Ron wanted me to get very good at a certain procedure because he was going to go away for a long vacation for six weeks. And he said, uh, Bruce, I want you to, um, you know, carry on doing your surgery lists uh, while I'm away. Uh, I was not happy with my technique and I'd had him in several times, you know, looking at what I was doing. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, he said, well, I'm going. And, I think <laughs> <laughs> and so I was pretty daunted by this. Yes. Uh, I was just at the beginning of this, this interval when I was about to start launching on my own. Now, there were other people who could supervise me. Don't right. me I could call on people. Right. They weren't right there in the next room. Uh, I was in my scripture union notes one morning, uh, reading early before going to work. And um, the, the psalm that was assigned for the day was Psalm 81. And there's a verse in Psalm 81 that really is more about the Egyptians coming out of, uh, you know, looking back on the Egyptian right. deliverance from Egypt, uh, from, from uh, the Israeli deliverance from Egypt. And, um, and it, it, there's a, there's a, there's a <clears throat> A statement of a, uh, by God in there, which is an unknown voice, oddly enough, in that psalm, uh, that it says, and I will take the burdens off your shoulders and I will free your hands from the basket. And that uh, just came out of the, lifted out of the page uh, to me at, at that particular time. And it was very liberating to know that the Lord was watching over this whole process. Uh, and to circle around, you may find this amazing. I do. But guess what my psalm this Sunday in my scripture union notes was? I, I don't know. Uh, psalm, psalm 81. Psalm 81. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, two observations. One is when we read the Bible regularly, uh, we just find things that, are God's word to us. They're God's word to everybody, but they speak to our need. If you don't read the Bible, you're not going to find those passages. Yes, right. Um, and so regular Bible reading is, is one of the great tools for us to understand our careers. But I also find it, it's, I think it's also true that a lot of people get stuck in their work and uh, they almost feel enslaved by their work. It could be a, a boss that's unpleasant or a series of tasks that are onerous or poor fitting for our aspirations and our skills and so on. And so to use a psalm that talks about Israel being liberated from slavery in Egypt is, is not a mistake. I mean, it's, we are, and Paul, the apostle Paul says this, you know, we are, everybody's a slave in some ways and everybody's free in some ways. And so don't worry too much about your situation, stay where you are. So you were, we might say, to some extent, enslaved, or you yes. felt captive mm -hmm. to your inability to do something. Yeah, to my uh, lack of heart and heart, hand-eye coordination in that particular technique. It was a technique where we have to work down a very, without excellent lighting and good vision, you just can't do it. And I was struggling getting it where it, it, it wasn't harming patients, but it wasn't, in my book, good enough um, to, to be ready to do it solo. Uh, no. But I will tell you that from that point on, um, there, was, there was a sense of liberation, mm. just like the Israelites must have felt coming through the Red Sea, yeah. moving towards the Promised Land. <laughs> well, uh, of course, all of us um, at work, ideally, are thinking, how can I love my neighbor through my work? I mean, 
surgery is an act of love for people who have a physical problem. And if I can just switch a little bit from surgery to after surgical care, that a uh, little bit later on became a major emphasis of yours. How can we uh, help people regain as much function as, as they possibly can? Tell us about that a little bit. What's, uh, what would an ordinary you know, thinking person not know about post-operative care? Sure. Um, well, we, we do the surgery and the human body has this marvelous healing capability, which the science of which is known quite well. Mm -hmm. um, and we heal up from our surgery. And if the surgery has been done correctly, hopefully many of the functions that are lost during the recovery period are restored partially or completely. So one can do carefully designed surgery to cure the disease and to restore function, um, but run into uh, loss of function later. If, for example, for cancer cases, mm -hmm. there can be other treatments that are needed uh, that can result in further loss of function, which is not loss of function like surgery that will heal. It may, it may never heal, or you might add in an additional treatment or two that intensify and additively um, destroy tissue, destroy tissue slowly, but steadily over time. And you can lose the function that the surgeon has uh, labored to preserve yeah. or to re restore. And so additional treatments beyond surgery for cancer cases became a special interest of mine because of the threat to function that they posed. Um, and I think around 2009, uh, I published a paper that made me really got my attention um, and it was data that came out of the objective analysis of the results we had in front of us in our database. Uh, it was data that was telling us that some of the additional treatments that were harming people um, and were acknowledged as harming people were not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we're not giving better results yeah. cancer-wise. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to see, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'll, I'll try to say this in uh, layman's terms. Um, after cancer, there's usually, um, well, during cancer treatments, there's chemo. And, and, you know, I mean, as a pastor, I've talked to many, many people who had cancer, right? Yes. Met with them, prayed with them before and after. And, yeah. you know, it feels like chemo, the goal is to come as close to killing you as possible without killing you. That, that's the way people describe it. But, you know, it's to shrink the tumor, but it's not always targeted as well as we'd like. And then afterward, there's radiation treatment, which, um, you know, I remember talking to a particular person, I wouldn't even say if it's a man or a woman, but uh, who had a, a cancer high in the chest. And, and then they had, they had radiation high in their chest. And they talked about the, um, the ongoing effects, the permanent effects of the radiation on their lower neck and, and their lungs. And so am I more or less in the right vicinity of uh, what you're talking about? So we, we need to have chemo and there's at least a sense we need radiation, but we don't wanna give radiation and chemo because they're so powerful uh, and do destroy tissues. That's the goal is to destroy cancerous tissues, but we don't wanna kill good tissues. Right, right. That's well put, Dan. I, that's just exactly the, the dilemma. Um, and I guess when one starts to question based on data mm -hmm. uh, as to the necessity or otherwise of potentially harming treatments, um, that can be, that can stoke and fuel some controversy. Right. And that's putting it politely. Yeah. Um, well, you're getting, you know, everybody says now you got to stay in your lane. Yes. And they, you know, people will say, why are you publishing data outside your field? But your sense is, well, actually, it's not outside my field. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, that's absolutely right. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because it, to do anything less than collect the data on these additional treatments and their impact um, would be less than fully integrated research, in, in my opinion. Um, and because they do have an impact on the, on the, on the outcomes. 
that we're all looking at. The outcomes are what we use as our outcomes of interest in finding the factors that impact those outcomes. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's essential to look as, at as many factors that may be impactful on the outcome of interest. And that includes additional treatments. And so it, it's, it's just do, what I would call doing good science. Right. But when it does impinge on treatments delivered by others, that's when the controversy arises. Right, right. To be blunt, I mean, you, you could say, I'm not saying you did say it, but you could publish data that indicate uh, your allegedly healing activities are actually harmful activities. I, I realize I'm oversimplifying. I'm not a physician well, or a surgeon. That, yeah, and that, and that was almost a given, really, um, in, in the field I was working in, that the, that the work, what we call toxicity, early and late toxicities on these right. treatments. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it hadn't been common for those folks who are not actually delivering those treatments to comment on their, on their necessity or not. Mm -hmm. And that's where it, there was a shift in the literature. And I actually had a colleague uh, the other day who I was talking to uh, because um, we were with another colleague and uh, he said, uh, um, I, I was at one of, meaning me, one of Bruce's presentations uh, in, it was actually in Phoenix in 2011 um, at one of our national meetings. And he said, um, that was the first time that I woke up to the idea that we need to be looking beyond, you know, just the technical aspects of our surgery. And, uh, you know, he said that re as, a, as a fellow surgeon saying right. that really got me thinking about broadening my interests in right. how much treatment we give our patients. Yeah. So it did begin to get attention. Um, and then in the end, we wrote some critiques for major cancer journals nationally, uh, along with uh, several other people at NP because I wanted my numbers to be stellar, mm -hmm. I, I included the prophet, one of the professors of mathematics at Washington University on the authorship team to critique uh, pretty comprehensively the lack of evidence through uh, upon which we were moving forward with these harmful treatments. The evidence I contended at, in a 12 point critique was not there to support yeah. these harmful treatments in certain specific situations. So, you know. <clears throat> right. You're not opposed to chemotherapy. No, I'm not opposed to any one therapy that, right. that is, is life-saving and doesn't, you know, harm the patient so badly that they have no life left. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll say it again in layman's terms. Um, so I had a very strange infection in the year 2020 and <clears throat> it was very mystifying to people and and uh, so I had to get a lot of tests and, and I got to see a, a great expert um, in through, uh, through some friends. I got to one of the great cardiologists because the, the, uh, the infection interfered with the electrical system of my heart, which happens once in a great while and it can happen to anybody. Um, but I, I, had a, I was trying to debate with him. I said, you know, you're giving me all these medications and they have a lot of side effects. And, you know, one of them, you know, 30 minutes after I take this pill, this is what happens every single time. And I said, you know, are you sure this is necessary? And his answer was, I'm not sure it's necessary yet, uh, but it could save your life. And uh, as we give you more tests, I'm, you know, I may take this medication off and I hope I can take it off, but I'm not going to take it off right now until I get all the results. I don't want, he didn't say it this way, but you know, I don't want you to die because you don't like a side effect right. of a medication that may be gone in four weeks. Right, right. And my sense is that all physicians are uh, operating in that sphere. Uh, we wanna make sure the treatment's not worse than the disease, but we also wanna keep people alive. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, that's a highly valid position to take. Um, as long as observably in front of the clinician, you know, you're not undergoing life-threatening side effects and toxicity. It's, right. it's quite, <clears throat> right. yeah. So as Christians, one of the things that uh, we agree on, I, I know we agree on this, is that it's very important to save a life, but saving a life isn't the only consideration. I mean, we're, we're eternal beings, right? We're all going to die at some point. And so one of the things you have to consider, let's suppose you're operating on a 25-year-old and um, 
you want to make sure you retain for that 25 year old salivary glands, tongue, um, hearing, et cetera, uh, whatever the surgery entails. And sometimes you might have to, is it, would you ever have to have a bit of a trade-off of um, there might be a tiny bit of extra risk of, of death, but I can save this person's tongue or their saliva glands. Is that, do you ever face that kind of situation? Um, yeah, really on a day-to-day -day basis, we're making those decisions. Fortunately, Dan, you know, uh, medical, especially cancer care has moved to a situation where we have multidisciplinary teams. Sure. Uh, and these are, these are extraordinarily useful because we get many opinions so-called for the price of one. Okay. This is no charge to the patient, really. It's just uh, something we do in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, as routine part of uh, tertiary level or quaternary level cancer care. Um, but yeah, there can, there can be a situation where, so let's say in my field, the swallowing mechanism is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have to then uh, recommend additional treatment that can threaten that swallowing mechanism. Uh, the unfortunate part about it is the medical science hasn't developed yet to know who's mechanism will be negatively affected and whose has it, whose mm -hmm. won't be, because we see this variation in outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that puts a level of risk uh, into uh, administering treatments that can be harmful. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's it just, it's very interesting. Patients, um, patients track, track you down, <laughs> having <laughs> treated thousands of them. And, and just two weeks ago, this letter arrived in my box um, handwritten, and it was a, a very sweet letter from a man from Kentucky, I think he, yes, Kentucky, and he said what his name was and when I treated him and so forth, but um, this, is, this is what he said. Um, the, he talked about the battles of getting through his surgery and battles of his additional treatments, and um, he said there was a certain treatment that he was recommended by others. And he said, you did not think I needed that uh, and that it might destroy the good um, and reduce my quality of life forever. You were okay with, you know, blankety blank treatment if a specific, in a specific targeted area in low doses. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your skills, honesty, true concern for what's best for patients, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the reality, and this, he really hit the nail on the head with this, the reality that standard does not work well for all. I'm seven, I'm now 71 years old and doing fine. I ride horses, garden, travel, spend time with grandchildren and loved ones due to your skills and advice, et cetera. I'll be forever grateful. And it just brings home in a very personal way in an individual way, the impact it can have on any one person mm -hmm. when one is trying to sift through and just not necessarily go with the standard of care. I have a lecture that I give called Beware the Standard of Care. Okay. And, and it's probably, you know, a little bit provocative. Indeed. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, but in certain contexts, I give that talk uh, and I, I outline in it the wonderful standards of care that have transformed the outcomes for patients and, and the more dicey ones where the evidence is flimsy. And that, <laughs> that can be a tricky area to, to address. Yeah, but that's why you do peer-reviewed work. And if I may say so, anybody who upsets the standard in any field, it could be engineering, it could be architecture, it could be teaching, uh, it could be count, you know, psychological counseling. Anybody who says, uh, we have adopted some methods that sounded persuasive, but don't produce results. Anybody who says that can be questioned yeah. and there'll be pushback because anytime anybody wants to change anything, there's somebody who benefits from the status quo and sees that a shift will harm them. I mean, that's, that's actually as old as Machiavelli, the prince. He said, anyone who wants to bring a governmental change is, is going to have this difficulty that the people who stand to lose by the change in government structures will quickly see what they'll lose and do, you know, they'll fight to protect their position of privilege. Yes. Whereas those who are attracted to it are attracted to a possibility. 
And so that is to say, it's not a certainty of what they'll gain. Therefore, your adversaries will be more resolved than your potential allies will be. Yes, absolutely true. Um, and I was fortunate to have allies in other institutions, fine places, yeah. uh, in, in other parts of the country and the world who I was communicating with on a regular basis with and publishing with. Right. We were combining our, evidence, our, our data uh, to, to give the evidence that was supporting our position. Right. Uh, so I was very blessed to have good allies uh, around the country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so again, just we'll make sure we say this is not, you know, uh, Dr. Bruce Hoey thinking stuff up and, and writing it up. It's peer reviewed. It's based on evidence yes. so that we're, um, even if there's a disagreement in your field, there are many other people who are agreeing with you and are examining the same data. And that's what gets published. Not that you have an idea, but you have an idea that's backed by data. Correct. Correct. You, you're trying to be you know, the whole basis of the scientific method, as you know, is the null hypothesis. You, you right. go to your data assuming that the finding that maybe is going to come out of it is not there. Right. And, and the null hypothesis is absolutely critical. It's been lost. You know, we, we get it taught in high school science, but it's been lost in a lot of medical science. And I, I regret that uh, because there's a lot of work I see that goes with quite fixed ideas to try and find the data that fits the, the a positive hypothesis, right. not a null hypothesis. So right. it, it's, it's very important uh, that we try to remain objective, um, but we all bring certain biases. It's just a matter of degree and whether we can put them on hold by having, making sure that other peers are uh, checking uh, what we're doing. But I would say on the peer review, uh, majority of my papers, Dan, which, uh, ultimately got published were rejected because of bad reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say in some cases, very ill-informed reviews, but of course okay. I'm biased, but the, any paper is your baby, as you know. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but all of them got a pretty thorough raking over before yeah. we got them to a point where we could get them into print. Yeah, and uh, as many people know, we've had a flood tide of papers retracted in the last few years, yes. and uh, there've been, you know, maybe maybe I'll have you and some other, a couple of scientists on about the problem of of increasing retractions and the frequency with which supposed findings are discovered to be invalid in the long run. But I want to I want to hit something else. Um, uh, we'll get to our lightning questions in a bit, but there's one more. You know, of course, it's important in science to lay aside your predispositions and your your, uh, your hope for an outcome. On the other hand, we, we can't and shouldn't lay everything aside. And as a Christian, one of your uh, guiding principles is that God created the human body and, um, and made it to function well, despite the fact that we're now fallen. Uh, how does your conviction that God made this body guide your work, whether research or surgery? Um. On a, starting at a more mundane technical level, um, the, the beauty of the color coding of what I see when I open the tissues okay. uh, is, is just breathtaking. And it's still breathtaking. And I still say to my trainees, look, we saw that nerve because it's white and amongst that sort of amorphous yellow fat area. Uh, see that glint of white we saw through there? That's, that's our Lord color coding. <laughs> that's that's a, good. The, the structures for surgeons. So, so that's just a technical level. Um, but at a more sophisticated physiological level, and um, uh, you know, the, the body is equipped with defenses. Um, and so the immune system, for example, it, and we're hearing an enormous about immune system in the lay news, of course, because of the coronavirus. Uh, and I hope mine's working because I got vaccinated yesterday. Oh, great. Um, but uh, the, 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 uh, the importance of the immune system in cancer care has become very heightened recently because the, the huge breakthrough that, that has occurred in many intractable uh, cancer system, systems or diseases in different organ systems throughout the body, the huge breakthrough I'd say that people would all acknowledge and someone recently got the Nobel prize for this was the new way of approaching cancer with immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Where 
agents are given that block the negative interaction between the tumor and the host's immune cells, that cut that off and allow, allow the host immunity to, to do its job. Mm -hmm. And when patients' genetic structure is such and their tumor structures, genetics is such that those drugs work, they're miraculous. Mm -hmm. uh, the tumor goes away and that's because the immune system, the power of the immune system has been unleashed on every cancer cell in that body. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a marvelous mechanism. And I think the Nobel Prize that was awarded was thoroughly deserved. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, so what you're saying, if I can, you know, uh, if, tell me if I'm, what you're saying is this new therapy allows the body to do what God designed it to do. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Even puts it on steroids, you might yeah. say. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. great. Uh, um, so anything so, else? How does your faith guide your um, guide your work? Well, I think I think the other major thing, Dan, is um, just the the human relational part of it, the doctor patient relationship. Um, it can be pretty sterile if there's if there's just you know clinical facts and right. people asking questions and okay we go sort of thing. Um, the difference between when I sometimes in a hurry and I just uh, talked with a patient briefly before surgery and we run them in, mm -hmm. the difference between that and fie on me for not making my schedule more relaxed that I can do this, but the difference that I notice when I can stop with a patient and say, do you have any questions? How are you feeling about going forward for surgery this morning? And if someone uh, says fine, or even if, you know, feel undaunted by it, but, or if they say, um, I'm pretty anxious, I'm pretty nervous. The, the precious moment I have to pray with it, to offer to pray with that patient. Uh, and, so, and, and this is how it usually goes. I, guess I, I usually start out, you know, they'll say something like, uh, I'm feeling very nervous, but I trust you. Mm -hmm. and, and I try not to shock people, but sometimes I say, well, in, a, in a, the right way, I say, I don't fully trust myself. I'm, yeah, right. I'm, I'm a instrument in God's hands. And I tell them I'm a Christian believer and that I think that the great physician is our heavenly father and Jesus Christ, his son. Mm. Uh, and Jesus healed much of what he was known for on earth, even mm. in the lay world, the historic lay report right. was his healings. Yeah. And I believe that through me, God can work to heal you. We don't know the outcome yet. We put it in his hands and then we pray. Mm -hmm. uh, and having just that minute of conversation mm -hmm. uh, can just, even for non-Christians, they come back and they say, thank you. You know, yeah. I don't believe, but I thank you for praying. Pray, yeah, pray. right. <laughs> yeah. so, I've, had, I've had exactly one person tell me they didn't want me to pray with them in my life. Yeah. Uh, and he was a... Uh, staunch atheist he was a professor and uh you know i said well he was going into surgery and uh, i just happened to meet him and we were talking no no i don't want you to pray that, that happened one time in my life and i guarantee you not everybody i offer to pray with is a christian yes and uh yeah but there's a sense that god exists and if they don't believe in god they're glad you do usually i think so <laughs> yeah i think so yeah so yeah. we're gonna start to our uh, lightning round okay. um, so we're gonna I'm going to ask you, you know, keep it simple on these. Sure. Uh, every job has glories and it's garbage detail. What is the garbage detail of being a surgeon? Uh, paperwork. No question. Paperwork. Yeah. It, now it's electronic, of course, yeah. but it's hours and hours and hours beyond the patient doctor interface that we're putting in to, to yeah. document correctly. Yeah. And you're saying you don't love that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number one. Number two, what's something about your work that no one would ever guess? Uh, ordinary person. I mean, obviously surgeons get it, but uh, what's a, what would people be surprised to learn? I think they'd be surprised to learn about how physicians sometimes lapse into discussions about the persona of their patients between each other. <laughs> it's sort of not fair because they're not there to defend themselves, but we do. It's a way of un unburdening your difficulty with handling a, a person's personality. Yeah, yeah. Just to share it with a colleague and say, hey, you know, you wouldn't believe what someone said to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Okay, good. In other words, uh, not the nice patients, but the ones who really set you on edge. Yeah, the nice patients do get a mention, Dan. So yeah, good. We, we do share that. That's great. Um, if you found yourself uh, hypothetically uh, going from the first floor to the 70th floor in an elevator that isn't going real fast to an aspiring young surgeon, and so you have you know 90 seconds, 60 seconds, what would you say to him or her? I would say learn everything you can. Mm -hmm. All right, you still have 50 seconds left, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, find the people who can teach you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I would say, work very hard to perfect your, your skills and achieve your ambition. Yeah. Yeah. In the world of sports, they say the goal is not, and, and music, <clears throat> the goal is not to practice until you can do it right. The goal is to practice until you can't do it wrong. I love that way of putting it. I love that way of putting it. Um, but the teacher is so critical. I'll give you one quick vignette. Uh, recently, not recently, several years ago, I um, decided being, I love water sports, and I decided being landlocked, the, the best thing to do was to tr take up triathlon. Mm. And I got hold, got hold of, was recommended to a coach, swimming coach, because I was going to do long events where I'd have to swim for over an hour. Mm. Uh, and this gentleman, uh, who's in St. Louis, uh, was a nationally uh, certified high level coach in, in a swimming technique that was really very relaxing and you could swim long, long distances without feeling fatigued mm. for the rest of the race. Yeah. And, and this particular individual showed me, uh, taught me as, as much as I know probably about teaching, uh, and completely changed my stroke mechanics from a windmilling style to a relaxed uh, sort of smooth rhythmical stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and his ability to demonstrate that and to articulate it in words and teach me to do that, it just made an enormous difference in a space of just a few months. Mm. A, lot of less, a lot of lessons in me practicing a lot or yeah. learning not to make mistakes, but, uh, it was an example, just a very graphic example to me of how important the teacher can be and how effective they can be or not be. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, last round of questions. If uh, not, what's your favorite book? But what book do you love to give to people that you care about? What's a book you love to give away? Or, okay. you know, our, our listeners, you know, really should think about reading this book. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it, may be, it might surprise some folks, but given the background that I've shared through your questions, um, it's, it's a book um, that I've got right here and I've given it to a lot of people. Oh yeah. Uh, and I might have even recommended it to you, Dan, at one point. Uh, called, you certainly did and I read it with great delight. It's called The Perfect Mile. Yep. And it's about the quest by three athletes in different countries in the, in the nine, early 1950s to achieve the four minute mile. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was, and it was written by a guy who's originally from St. Louis. Okay. Uh, Neil Bascom is his name, The Perfect Mile. And it catalogs the completely different approaches these four outstanding athletes had to accomplishing the breaking of the four minute mile. Uh, right. To me, it's one of the most gripping books. And again, it gets my competitive juices, my achievement juices, and my interest in the details of what can lead up to a great accomplishment um, really flowing. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, the story of Roger Bannister's uh, often told as one of individual achievement, but it's extremely clear that he could never have done it without his yeah. team, everybody collaborating. Yeah. And I, re I remember from the book, um, I think it's only the last 200 yards or so that he ran first. Uh, he was always letting them break the wind just a little bit for him. Yep, he had and a team. Correct. Finally, one of the guys, I mean, I read this, I don't know, eight, eight years ago, but I believe one of the guys peeled off and said, you know, essentially, you're okay, you're on your own to bring it home, which he did by less than a second. Yeah, he kicked at 230 yards out. Yep. And then he and that brought him to the front. And at 200 yards, he took off and three minutes, 59.4 seconds. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah.
Uh, so I think I know the answer to the question I like to ask people, what do you do to relax? Um, I mean, I know you love sports. Anything else? What do you do to relax so you're not working all the time? Yeah, so um, since we moved to Florida, uh, I've tried to spend a lot more time um, just gardening and um, on the beach uh, where we're, you know, being a coastal location. It's uh, yeah. very pleasant. Um, trying to spend more time with my dear wife, who has... Uh, put up with countless, countless thousands of hours of solo, <laughs> um, solo marriage, so we say, I, that's not the right word, yeah. uh, being on her own. Uh, R relative isolation. Yet right. being married, yeah, right. right. Um, and then now with grandchildren, several of whom live here in Florida, uh, having the delight of seeing them grow up and spending time with them. Yeah. yeah. As, as we were saying beforehand, I had the pleasure of of my grandson in my house yesterday in a meeting uh, that was being recorded <laughs> and i heard my wife saying no 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 you can't go in you <laughs> papa's on a very important meeting but you know papa's there and it's irresistible and he gave me a hug real quick and i gave him a hug and and he's four yeah and uh, that was good enough he just needed a hug and i think it did not destroy the recording we, so we in the little bubble during some of the yeah. serious surges in COVID right. with the grandchildren and uh, it was so touching because yes. little Thomas, who's named yes. after my dad, uh, he would say, oh, but Papa, why do you have to go to work? And his little face would fall, <laughs> don't go to work. <laughs> it's very right. heartwarming. Yeah. Um, so let's see, I wanna ask you, uh, if somebody wanted to read about your work, where would they go? Oh, uh, there's, there's is there anything no... that an ordinary person can understand about the life of a surgeon? Yeah. Oh, well, and oh, you got me there, Dan. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, for me personally, I'm, I'm always thinking of, you know, tech, pretty technical, deep down scientific stuff. Uh, well, but you know, you're allowed. Listen, I mean, we're going to post this and then people can uh, look at the bonus uh, bonus notes afterwards. So. Okay. If you don't have an answer to that question, uh, we'll put it on our website and people can find it. All right. All right. That'll, that'll, uh, the people who really want the answer to that question will be able to find it. Find I'm that. thinking about the person who might, you know, have a, I don't know, relative who's a surgeon or a dear friend, want to understand their work, or maybe somebody who's younger and is uh, considering medical school and possibly being. Right. The, yeah. There are certainly books out there on, on surgeons. Yeah. Lives. Um, one beautiful one is um, something the Lord made. It's a movie, actually. Okay. And this is a great resource. Okay, uh, there we go. It involves scientific research, surgical research, and it's the development of the operation by a gentleman called Dr. Blaylock, who started off at Vanderbilt and then went to Hopkins. And a story of he and his lab assistant, whose name just escapes me for a moment, but the development of the so-called Blaylock shunt, which turned blue babies who would die in a matter of days to weeks uh, into uh, children who could live a normal life. Mm. What's, the, what's, what's the movie called? Something the Lord Made. And it's from a book also. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> just, it's mu as much about his lab assistant, who was an African-American in that era of the, I believe the 60s, mm. 50s and 60s in the United States, and who was, t he invented the operation in mm. dogs. Mm. And, and really taught it to Blaylock, mm. who sort of publicized it in the, in the medical world. But um, it's a wonderful story. And his lab assistant was given a, I believe, a, uh, at least an honorary, if not a full professorship at Hopkins in recognition. That's That's a terrific. wonderful story. Yeah. <clears throat> um, last question. Who should I interview next? I think maybe on that same theme, why don't you give Ben Carson a call? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll give it a try. I don't, I don't yeah. know him. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, he may I, have, he may have a busy schedule, but sure. Right, right. he may not, not be so busy with the change yeah. of government. But anyway, I think he would be a wonderful interviewee as someone who's had an amazing life story from mm -hmm. a fairly hum, a very humble background through to uh, a cabinet position, and um, you know, going through. Uh, all this, the trials of a surgeon who was developing new techniques. Mm. Yeah, it's great. And he's a fine man as well. He is a, he is a very uh, committed believer. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Bruce, if I may say so, I think you're a fine man. And I thank you for giving me uh, a portion of your, a, a generous portion of your morning. I'm confident that it will be encouraging to many people and not just people in medical care, uh, but anybody who's looking at innovation, anybody <clears throat> who's watching the way maybe their various life experiences and skills come together um, as, uh, as has happened for you by the Lord's design. Yes. So yes. thank you for your time. You're very welcome. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate us on your preferred podcast platform. You can visit our website, the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis at faithandworkstl.org. There you can subscribe to our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, learn about our Faith and Work cohorts, leave a message for us, and more. Here are the questions for today's podcast with Bruce Hoey. What is your highest and rarest gift or your most strategic gift? Do you feel a responsibility to use your gifts as Dr. Hoey does for the good of your neighbor, for humanity? How does your faith affect the way you approach your work? What special insights does it give you? Think of Bruce talking about the color coding of certain nerves. Join our discussion at facebook.com slash faithandworkstl or our Instagram at faithandworkstl. I'm Christina Hanna, Program Director for Center for Faith and Work.